Hello, I'm Andrew. This is Working for the Word. Let's get this show started. I want to dive into a topic today that is super important for the world of Bible translation, and that's how we can teach mother tongue translators Greek and Hebrew or Aramaic. One of the slightly embarrassing truths about Bible translation is that most projects going on and that have gone on in the past 100 or 200 years have been done primarily by people who do not have a strong command or any command of the original languages of Scripture. This is primarily because for centuries now, the church has largely regarded Hebrew and Greek as something that is not for the common man. We can't expect most people, especially missionaries who are busy with all kinds of other things that they have to learn, to also learn or master Hebrew and Greek then it's even less of a priority if you're going into the jungle to a people group who doesn't even have a form of writing to teach them the biblical languages so that they can do translation of the Bible. That has been unthinkable and just unrealistic for most people in the history of the church. Now, why is that? I would like to propose three main reasons. So, number one, intimidating methodology. Number two, insufficient technology and number three, expense. So let's break these down one by one. Since the Middle Ages, most people have taught Hebrew with what's called the grammar method. Now this method treats the language more like a code that you've got to learn to crack rather than something you use and enjoy like we use English. With this method, you're swiftly introduced to complicated paradigms that you have to learn through rote memorization or if the teacher is extra creative, then he'll come up with some songs or some other mnemonic devices. Now, in a lot of ways, it feels like doing math. In other words, it's not at all like the way you learn to speak your mother tongue as a child. For most people, this is just too intimidating. So they leave it to the quote-unquote professionals. Now, before I go on to point two, This podcast is not meant to trash traditional methodology and all of the godly men and women who have poured out their lives to teach Hebrew and Greek in this traditional grammatical method in seminaries and churches. That's not the point of this at all. I highly respect those people, and mostly, I would say 99.9% of those people are just doing what they were taught. They never saw anyone do it differently. They never were presented with another option. And so they're just doing what has always been done, and that's fine. Um, I have done that for years as well because I was trained in this way, and so I've gone and trained other people in this way. So getting back to our main obstacles or reasons why most people think that learning Greek and Hebrew is only for the spiritually elite or for crazy eccentric nerds or whatever else. So number two is insufficient technology. And by that I mean that for centuries there's just been no way for one person to teach millions of people like you can on YouTube today. So you could print a book that teaches people, but because of the intimidation factor that I just mentioned, most people wouldn't buy your book. And if they did, they wouldn't end up using it. Languages are learned best with a teacher who shows you how to use the language, who demonstrates it so that you can hear it a lot, see the context it's being used in, and get a feel for how it works. And you just can't do that with a textbook. So on top of that, books appeal to literate cultures, not oral cultures, and 70% of the world's cultures are oral. So that means that the vast majority of Christians in the world don't come from a culture that's used to learning things from books. And this was even more true before the printing press, right? Jesus lived in an oral culture, which is why he spent so much time talking to people instead of handing out books. It's also interesting that Jesus never wrote a book, but that's another topic. Number three. Only in the last 150 years have books become affordable to normal people who live in literate cultures like the West. But in most of the rest of the world, books tend to be unaffordable for the average person. I saw this over and over 
in Central Africa. If someone does save up for a book, they'll buy something that's not intimidating. Exactly, not a Hebrew grammar, not a Greek grammar. They're not going to save up and buy that. They're going to buy something that is not intimidating. And what's worse, Hebrew textbooks tend to be way more expensive than other books, or Greek, and they're almost never translated into other languages outside of the West. Why? Because books don't sell well in oral cultures, obviously. So most of the church gets left with no option to learn Hebrew because they're too poor, don't know English, and didn't grow up in a literate culture. So I don't know about you, but the situation seems a bit unfair. So fast forward to what my wife and I are doing with Aleph with Beth. I want to highlight in this episode that everything that we are doing on this YouTube channel is with in extreme intentionality, with scientific backing, and with a lot of purpose. I'm afraid that some people might look at a YouTube channel like ours and think, oh, well, how cute. That is just so creative, and wow, good for them. But if I want to really be serious about learning Hebrew, I need to go to a seminary, I need to pay $3,000 to really learn or I need to go to Hebrew University in Jerusalem. That's where the real stuff happens. But YouTube, you know, if you guys wanna play around with that, that's great. So in this podcast, I wanna help you understand a little bit of the science and the reasoning behind why we're doing what we're doing on YouTube and why it's important. For a long time, because of those reasons that I mentioned, language learning in general in general, not even the biblical languages, but in general, has needed to go through a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts usually don't happen overnight, and they need a lot of traction before they can get going. So what we're trying to do is help give traction to what needs to happen in the world of biblical language training. Why? Because of what I just mentioned. If we don't change our paradigm, we're gonna remain in the same state where Bible translation keeps being done by people who don't know the biblical languages. So number one, they're flying half blind, and number two, they're always, always totally dependent on outside quote-unquote experts or professionals. Once again, I'm not trying to trash those who have gone before. I'm not trying to overly criticize, but I want to say that In academia, our purpose is not to just tiptoe around and make sure we never step on anyone's toes because they might feel bad that they were doing something that wasn't the best way of doing it, or that they were writing or teaching something that wasn't really grounded in the evidence or wasn't a good representation of the evidence. Our goal in academia is to have a conversation where we can sharpen each other, where we can say, hey, Let's think about doing this differently because it can serve people better. It can actually help us accomplish our goal faster, more efficiently, with higher quality, and all of that. So let's talk about a guy who has been challenging the status quo of language learning for a long time. This is nothing new, and I would argue that it's actually as ancient as creation because we're just discovering that there's so much to learn about language learning from children and how children learn languages. So in case you've never heard of him, I want to introduce you to Stephen Krashen. Very important linguist, professor of language acquisition. He's done a lot of study in bilingual education and reading. He's authored more than 486 publications and he has a PhD from the University of California in Los Angeles. One of the things he taught is that when you learn a language, the most important thing is to hear a lot of the language or experience a lot of the language in a way that is comprehensible. That means that the content presented to you needs to be in a format that communicates implicitly what's going on whether through images or objects or actions. Now, he pointed out that language acquisition does not 
require extensive use of conscious grammatical rules and does not require tedious drills. He also argued that the best methods for teaching a language are those that give comprehensible input in low anxiety situations with messages that students actually want to hear. And he also said that it's important not to force people to talk early in the second language before they're ready, but allow students to start talking when they're ready, when they feel ready. Students improve when you supply them with more communicative and comprehensible input rather than forcing them to speak and write and then correcting them. Now, I think at this point, rather than me just summarizing a bunch of stuff that he said, let's just listen to the guy himself talk about this. It is really, really fascinating, and he's a great speaker. The theory begins, the cornerstone of the theory is a hypothesis that we've called the acquisition learning hypothesis. It says that we have two very different ways of going about the job of getting better in another language. You can acquire language, you can learn language, and they're very different. Acquisition I've described as a subconscious process. And subconscious really means two things. It means, first of all, while you're acquiring, you don't always know you're acquiring. It goes on below your level of awareness. For example, you're reading a book, you're listening to a conversation, you're listening to a presentation such as this one. You are, of course, listening to the presentation, you are reading the book, but without realizing it at the same time, you might be acquiring. Second, once you're finished acquiring, you're not always aware that anything has happened. Uh, a good demonstration of this is the universal experience we've had of hearing someone make a mistake in our own language. Now, when you hear someone make a mistake in your own language, very rarely can you tell exactly what rule was broken. Uh, when I hear someone make a mistake in English, for example, my first language, uh, most of the time I can tell what rule was broken. I have a PhD in linguistics, which in grammar, in fact, which some people find a strange thing to have studied. But even despite all this training in grammar, I can't always tell exactly what rule was broken. Instead, I have a feeling that something is wrong, but I can't quite put my finger on it. That feeling for correctness, that feeling for language, is what we call language acquisition. We think everyone can acquire language. Everyone can pick up language subconsciously. Children acquire their first languages. Children acquire second languages. Adults acquire language. The ability to subconsciously pick up language does not disappear when you enter school. It does not disappear when you become a teenager. It doesn't disappear when you get older. It's with us forever. We think the language acquisition device never shuts off. Very different from acquisition is what we call learning. That's what most of us did in school. Learning is knowing about language, conscious knowledge of language. Uh, in English public schools, for example, we learn that a noun is the name of a person, place, thing, or idea. We learn that the subject and the verb are supposed to agree. This is conscious language learning. Language acquisition and language learning are very, very different. In fact, I think very different psychological processes are involved. Of the two, acquisition and learning, the research has been telling me that acquisition is far more important. Here's how we think they interrelate. When you're about to say something in another language, and it's easy to see in a language you don't speak very well, if you can put yourself in that position. When you come out with a sentence easily, it comes from what you've acquired, not from what you've learned. All the rules that you learned in school do only one thing for you. They act as a monitor or an editor. So let's say you've picked up, you've learned a little French in school, you speak French uh, as a low intermediate, you're about to have a conversation in French. The sentence you're about to say pops into your mind from your subconscious somewhere. Then just before you say it, the theory says you scan it, you look at it, you inspect it, you think of the rules you learned in school, and you make corrections. This isn't, I should emphasize, not simply an idea that came from the ivory tower. It's based on research, and the evidence for it is in uh, technical books and journals in the professional literature, but also happens to correspond with the intuitions that many people have about what happens to them when they try to speak other languages.
Uh, rather than go through all the research now, what I prefer to do is talk immediately a little about the uh, pedagogy, what went through my mind uh, 11 years ago when I first thought of this idea that there are these two processes and they're related in this certain way. My original idea was this, and I thought it was good common sense. Acquisition gives us our fluency. Learning gives us our accuracy. It's an attractive idea. We have two components. They make two very different kinds of contributions. Clearly, we want both. We want language students to speak easily and fluently, but we also want the grammar to be there. We don't want a grammarless pigeon. So what I thought then is what we need is a balanced program. Two days a week acquisition, two days a week learning. Two days a week conversation, two days a week grammar. Now, that sounds very fair. The truth must be somewhere in the middle. It has intuitive appeal. Unfortunately, it's wrong. In fact, it's all wrong. What the research has been telling me for the last 10 plus years, no matter where you turn, no matter where you look, the important role is with acquisition. Acquisition gives us fluency and accuracy. For the adult, for the analytic thinking, grammar-loving adult, it's at least 95% acquisition, possibly more. For the, for the child, it's 100%. And I'd also like to admit this to you. No one was more disappointed to discover this than me. As I mentioned briefly at the beginning of this discussion, my graduate work was in grammar. My PhD is in grammar. Uh, like many language teachers today, I love grammar. Uh, my life used to revolve around grammar. My best friends are grammarians. I love to discuss relative clauses. The problem is that that's not how language acquisition happens. Language acquisition does not happen by learning grammar rules, by memorizing vocabulary lists. This leads then to our major point. If acquisition is more important than learning, we must ask how it happens. How do we help people acquire language? This is, of course, the major theoretical point for the universities, and it's also the major pedagogical point. If acquisition is more important than learning, that's what we want to have happen in our classrooms. Let me begin this discussion by making what may appear to be an outrageous claim. I think we all acquire language in exactly the same way. The reason this is an outrageous thing to say is that these days in education, as many of you have undoubtedly noticed, we're living in an age of individual variation. We're very concerned with how our students are different, not how our students are the same. We're concerned about individual variation in cognitive style and learning style, which side of the brain people are using, etc. And there's a lot of very good research on individual variation. Nevertheless, there are some things we all do the same, and language is one of them. It's as fundamental as universal, as breathing, as eating, as walking. We all do it and we all acquire it the same way. The way we acquire language is amazingly simple. We acquire language when we understand messages. When people speak to us in another language and we understand what they say, or we read something in another language and we understand the message, language acquisition will take place. In fact, it's a, an amazing thing, language acquisition takes place necessarily. It's unavoidable. You can't help it. Given messages people understand, what we call comprehensible input, the language acquisition device goes to work. It happens subconsciously, automatically, and inevitably. Um, some of you will recognize some of these ideas from Chomsky's philosophizing, especially from his book Reflections on Language. My contribution to uh, the Chomsky way of thinking is to claim that not only is there a language acquisition that works in children, but it works for second languages as well. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, it doesn't degenerate. Its function is full to the end of our lives. Okay, so we acquire language when we understand it. This major idea of comprehensible input has two corollaries. One corollary has to do with speaking. Speaking Talking is not practicing. The ability to speak another language is a result of acquiring it, not its cause. For example, if you want to improve your English, 
It will not help you to speak English to yourself as you drive to work in the morning in your car. If you want to improve your French, it will not help you to close the bathroom door and speak French to the mirror. I used to think those things help. Now I'm convinced they don't. The ability to speak a language is a result of getting language acquisition, uh, not its cause. If you are, if we, in fact, you can look at your own experience to see that this is so. If you've ever been a student in a language class, you can see this. If you give adults comprehensible input, uh, if they understand the messages, in a good language class, after a week or two, 10, 15 hours on the average, my experience has been that talking simply comes. It emerges on its own. You literally can't hold it back unless there's some kind of block, which we'll talk about later. Uh, again, evidence for this is all over the theoretical literature, in my opinion. Um, many of us have had practical experiences which demonstrate that it's so as well. Children who come to countries uh, immigrant children, for example, limited English proficient students in the United States, for example. Typically when they arrive, they don't start speaking right away. There's usually a period of several months until they start talking. What we typically see then, when children do start to speak, is that their speech follows a certain natural development in language acquisition. Certain things come early, certain things tend to come in the middle, certain things come later. And after a year or so, they're typically, if they're in an input-rich situation, speaking fairly well. When they start to speak, it's not the beginning of their language acquisition. When they start to speak, it's the result of the comprehensible input they've gotten over the few months of what we call their silent period. Another corollary of this important idea of comprehensible input has to do with the kind of input we present to people. We have in language classes the principle of grammatical sequencing. We're all familiar with this. For example, in our first week of language class, everything is in the present tense. Uh, we can only talk about objects in the room, uh, what we're doing at this time, at this moment in class. Suddenly, at the end of uh, the first month, we become obsessed with the past. We can only talk about last week and last year. Uh, eventually, we can only, the third month, you can only talk about the future. What will you do when you finish school, etc. We call this grammatical sequencing, and its goal is to aid in the acquisition of grammar. The theory says it has exactly the opposite impact. The major subhypothesis says that if we give people comprehensible input and we give them a lot of it, grammatical sequencing is not only not necessary, it's probably harmful. Let me repeat that a major goal of language class is not just to, pre, not just to bring about grammatical fluency in students, it's also to get the maximum level of grammatical accuracy. My position is that the way to do this is to give students a great deal of comprehensible input. that will produce both fluency and accuracy. The theory says that if enough, if enough input is present, if there's a rich source of comprehensible input, all the rules that the students are ready to acquire. Examples of all these rules will be there in the input. Um, if you compare, for, I think that grammatical sequencing has insurmountable problems that comprehensible input handles with ease. Let me just give you the feeling for a couple of these problems. Let's say you're taking a standard language class. Say it's uh, French, and it's at the beginning level. And today is... Uh, past tense day. Today's the day we're going to review the past tense. And you're absent. You're sick. You can't come to class. Something's wrong. Well, the way we currently teach language, it's too bad. You've missed the past tense. You've got to wait till next year when we go through the whole language syllabus again. With comprehensible input, that's not a problem. If you miss class one day, don't worry. Come back tomorrow. You'll hear more comprehensible input. You'll hear more of the rule that you happen to be ready for, no matter what that rule is you'll see it in the readings. It's the same idea as the well-balanced diet as compared to single doses of individual vitamins. We have a much better chance of supplying the student exactly what he or she needs. Probably the worst problem, though, with the grammatical syllabus is that it's boring. It's very hard to present messages that are interesting and comprehensible to people when our hidden agenda is the relative clause or any other rule. What we're now saying is if we give people messages that are interesting and comprehensible, 
grammar to a large extent takes care of itself. And as most of us who've taught language know, this is easily difficult enough. A final hypothesis will conclude the brief review of fundamental aspects of the theory for us. It's called the affective filter hypothesis, a term I borrowed from Dulé and Burt. To go over this hypothesis, I first need to give you a very brief review of what we know about affective variables. The research has shown us to, I think, no one's great surprise that motivation counts in language acquisition. This is, of course, uh, a well-researched area, and I'm only going to give you the tip of the iceberg. Uh, students who are more motivated do better in language acquisition, and this is uh, to be expected. Self-esteem also counts. Those who are better in self-esteem, who have better self-image, do better in language acquisition. Uh, I've noted that self-esteem is a dominant concept today in uh, popular psychology, and it's no surprise to see it here as well in language acquisition. There's also a relationship between anxiety and language acquisition. Very simply, the lower the anxiety, the better the language acquisition. It's a negative correlation. My suspicion is for language acquisition to really proceed optimally, anxiety should be zero. Now, this has happened to some of us. If you've been in a situation where you're so involved in speaking another language, a language you may not control very well, that you temporarily forget that you're dealing with another language, when anxiety is temporarily zero, when you're totally focused on the message, that's when you're acquiring. Now, just uh, a footnote before I go on. A uh, misunderstood point about anxiety, I think. I don't think it uh, necessarily applies to everything. I think it applies to language acquisition, but uh, perhaps it has its limits. As a parent, as a uh, university teacher, I'm not particularly progressive. I think that children in elementary school should learn their multiplication tables, uh, no nonsense. I think that graduate students in my program at the University of Southern California should suffer, as graduate students should. In other words, I've finally learned what uh, they tried to teach me in educational psychology all those years ago, that the amount of anxiety or drive it takes to accomplish a task depends on the task. Some things require what we call facilitative anxiety. I don't believe in torture, but sometimes a little anxiety is good. Language acquisition, though, is different. For language acquisition, the pressure has to be off entirely. Frank Smith, in his discussion of what he calls sensitivity, says something very similar, and I think says it very well. He says, for language acquisition to succeed, the acquirer, he's speaking of children, I think it's true of everyone, has to assume he's going to be successful. The way we integrate this into the theory is this. If the student isn't motivated, if self-esteem is low, if anxiety is high, if the student is on the defensive, to borrow a phrase from Earl Stevick, if he thinks the language class is a place where his weaknesses will be revealed, not a place where he'll get new input, a block goes up. We call this block the affective filter. When the filter is up, the student may understand the input, but the input won't reach those parts of the brain that do language acquisition. The block will keep it out. Somewhere in the brain, according to Chomsky, is a language acquisition device. For acquisition to happen, comprehensible input must enter the language acquisition device. If the student isn't motivated, if anxiety is high, self-esteem is low, a block will keep this data, this comprehensible input, out. Acquisition will not occur. This explains how it can be that we can have two students in the same class, both getting the same comprehensible input. In one case, there's acquisition. In another case, there isn't. In one case, the child is open to the input. In the other case, the block keeps it out. Let me now summarize in, in a minute what just took me 20 minutes to say. We acquire language in one way, when we get comprehensible input in a low anxiety situation. Now, if this is true, we then have to consider how we should teach it. Uh, the first question that comes up is whether we even need language classes at all. Uh, most people say no. Most people don't believe in language classes. And if I phrase the question correctly, I'm sure that some of you will find yourself not believing in language classes. 
Let's say, for example, that you're at a party, someone discovers that you're interested in language, and of course they say to you, you know, I've always wanted to learn, let's say, uh, French. What do we tell them? Go to the local school and take French one, go to the university and take beginning French, go to the private language school and take beginning French. We don't say that. We say things like, go to France, go to Canada, go to Quebec, go to the country. It seems reasonable, but it's bad advice. Let me give you my situation. Even though I live in Los Angeles, California, I don't speak Spanish. Que lastima. What would happen if I went to Mexico, which is two and a half hours away, to try to learn to speak Spanish? I wouldn't understand anything. It would simply be noise. It would be a waste of time. But if I went to a well-taught Spanish class, a ta class taught correctly, the first day I could get 45 minutes of comprehensible input. That's what language classes are for. Language classes are designed to give you the comprehensible input that the outside world can only give you with great difficulty. The beginner belongs in a language class. A beginner can get more from two days in a language class than a week or two in the country. Now, let's say I take two, three semesters, say 50 to 100 hours of comprehensible input Spanish, then I go to Mexico. It's a different story. I can understand a little bit. I can understand when people speak to me. I can have conversations, which are very good ways of getting comprehensible input. I can read a little bit. I can then use the outside world to get more comprehensible input. The goal of the language class, then, is to put you in a position so you can go to the outside world and get more comprehensible input. Now, when I first get to Mexico, after two or three semesters, my Spanish will not be perfect. I'll make mistakes. The goal of the language class, of the beginning language class, is not to make you perfect. The goal of the language class is to make you an intermediate, so you can then get more comprehensible input from the outside world. Now, in case you think this is a, uh, a lowering of standards, I think it's nothing more or less than a common sense philosophy of education we all subscribe to. When those of us who are out in the field finished our university, our college language training, of course we weren't the polished professionals we are today. If your career has been anything like mine, I've learned three times as much every year on the outside as I did all through college, of course but my university training was necessary. Without it, I could never have begun my career as a professional professor and uh, researcher. The same thing is true with the elementary language class. The outside world is more valuable. Acquisition will come faster on the outside, but our goal is to put students in a position so they can take advantage of the input on the outside. Just a brief review of what's going on now from my point of view in elementary language teaching. At the elementary level, I think there are some fine methods that do what they're supposed to do. They provide comprehensible input in a low anxiety situation. And from what I can tell in reading reports in the professional literature, these are the superior methods. Students are doing better in these methods than they do in grammar programs, what we call drill and kill programs. Uh, the methods that seem to work, where there is a lot of comprehensible input, uh, low anxiety, etc., uh, the one I've been connected with is Tracy Terrell's natural approach. Uh, James Asher's total physical response method is another one, and Professor Asher has, I think, collected massive uh, empirical evidence in favor of his method. And again, I think it works basically because it provides comprehensible input. I'm uh, very positive about Suggestopedia, Lazanov's method developed in Bulgaria. Again, the, uh, in fact, the research reports I've read from the United States uh, confirms, confirm that it's a good method. I think it uh, goes a long way toward lowering the affective filter and providing comprehensible input. As good as these methods are, they're probably not enough. They don't bring students to the point where they can actually use the language on the outside in uh, sophisticated situations, in academic situations, as a method of supplementing the language class, we have borrowed an idea from the successful Canadian immersion programs and have been teaching subject matter in a comprehensible way to language students. Just to give you an idea, an experiment we did at the University of Ottawa 
a couple of years ago. It appears in the Canadian Modern Language Review, uh, with uh, published, co-authored with Henry Edwards, Mari Vesha, and uh, Richard Clement. We took English-speaking students and French-speaking students at the University of Ottawa, a bilingual university, and taught them psychology in their second language, in their weaker language. The English students took psychology courses in French. The French students took it in English. These were students who were not very advanced, but they weren't beginners in the second language. We found that the students not only learned as much psychology as comparison students, they improved their language competence very satisfactorily. And it was just the kind of improvement we hope of academic English, academic French, that will help them survive in a regular class. So, in other words, they got lectures in psychology made comprehensible in the second language, and they acquired language and subject matter at the same time. Other people have since uh, confirmed our results. All right, this is the basic outline of the theory. There's a great deal more to it, but I think these are the fundamentals. I'd just like to conclude with some comments on what the difficulties are. As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, there are two major difficulties in acceptance. One is our students, the second is us. Our students expect grammar. Our students expect vocabulary lists. Our students expect exercises. And very often, when we don't provide a great deal of grammar, they think it's a sign of professional incompetence on our part. I can think of a couple of solutions to this. First of all, I'd like to uh, go back on what I've said in a couple of my previous uh, works. I recommended a little tongue-in-cheek that we engage in deception. We teach our students in the target language, but we teach them grammar, teach them vocabulary, give them what they want. And regardless of their personal philosophy of language acquisition, they will acquire because they're getting comprehensible input, because it's being done in the second language. Uh, a former colleague of mine, Steve Sternfeld, who's now at the University of Utah, uh, forced me to change my position. He argued that this is not the way to go. He said that what does it matter if a student has gained a certain amount of proficiency in a second language if he doesn't know how he got it? Our goal, Sternfeld argued in his dissertation, is not only to teach language, but to teach students how to acquire language so that they can become autonomous and improve on their own. So Sternfeld has convinced me that our goal is not simply language acquisition, but to inform our students about the process of language acquisition so they can become autonomous. The second problem is us. For language professionals, acquisition and learning are very, very different. For people like us, acquisition seems slow. Learning seems very quick. For people like us who are familiar with grammar, we can pick up a grammar book of a language we don't know very well and get a good feeling for the grammar of a language in several hours. It seems to come quickly. Of course, I've argued this information is not available to us in actually using the language. Second, acquisition seems subtle. Learning seems very concrete. You can touch it. You can taste it. For people like us, learning is pleasant. We like it. I'll never forget when I learned consciously, which wasn't very long ago, the subjunctive in French. Every time I say the subjunctive correctly, I rekindle the victory of having first consciously learned it. Il faut que j'aille. Of course, it's not there when I need it. What we have to remember, I think, is that normal people get their pleasures elsewhere. Now, what you just heard, I'm going to link in the description. It's available publicly on YouTube in the form of two videos. So what are some of the implications of this? It's a lot to chew on, <laughs> a lot to process. And one of the things he highlights I want to talk about is this principle that there must not be any stress involved in the process. Now, later on, we're going to listen to him reiterate this. Uh, this was early in life for him, and then we're going to fast forward to a presentation he gave later in life, actually in the present time. And so this issue that if students feel threatened or on the defensive, a mental block goes up and prevents language acquisition from happening. 
So the more students can feel at ease, encouraged, and believe that success is possible for them, the more language they'll internalize. Now, why is this important? Until now, the main way for someone to learn Hebrew in this comprehensible input method has been to study in Israel for a number of months or years. This is not the only way, but it has been the main way. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars is being poured into a push to get more and more people into these kinds of programs in Israel, especially Bible translators and people who were trying to train to be consultants. Well, if we're taking Stephen Krashen seriously, we should keep in mind that culture shock So we're talking about going to Israel to study. Culture shock, strange food, the high cost of living, missing family back home, getting used to a new roommate, and having to navigate a new context in modern Hebrew, in addition to biblical Hebrew in class, may all add up to significant stress, which in turn hinders the language learning process. Sometimes Bible translators from other countries struggle with life in Israel, not because of the quality of their program or care that they receive from personnel, but simply because they have to adapt to so many new things at once, and they miss their families. So, our question at Aleph with Beth is, how can we best serve our brothers and sisters? The answer is, give them the option to learn from the comfort of their own home. Now, I am not somebody who is idolatrous with comfort. I went to Equatorial Guinea. I moved there without ever having visited the place. It is a crazy, crazy country under a dictatorship, and I was mugged in a taxi and robbed... um, You know, there's all kinds of stuff that I've been through there. I'm not um, someone who ascribes to safetyism, or I'm not into this whole tendency in American culture to just, you know, give everyone more comfort. But I do believe that this element of language learning is sound, this hypothesis. Now, what could be less intimidating than free videos? that you can rewind and repeat as much as you need at your own pace from the comfort of your own home. There are no other students, and what's more, there are no other students who might laugh at your mistakes, no teacher who might occasionally run out of patience, and I've been one of those, believe me. And you're not worried about how the farm is back home or missing your spouse and kids. So the implications of this is that, and this is going to sound crazy and radical, is that in-person teaching is not necessarily a silver bullet. It is not necessarily the ideal, which I have been a proponent of for years, and I'm starting to have to rethink that. And I actually believe that God is using this global virus to help us come to this realization among a million other things. Now, I'm not saying it would be a bad idea to go to Israel. I'm just saying that it may not be the best idea to go there to start learning. Maybe once you're an intermediate, you can go there, and then you can navigate all the culture shock and change and stuff because you already have a firm foundation in biblical Hebrew. And then you can take full advantage of the time you're there and enjoy it. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do as we build out these videos is that we want to serve the global church and level the playing field so that everyone has an equal, stressless opportunity to learn biblical Hebrew. And here's the thing. We invite others who teach this way to join us in making more comprehensible input content available for free. We cannot do this alone. To do a paradigm shift, we have to have thousands and thousands of comprehensible input resources, videos, graded readers, you name it. We have to have those, and we need help to do that. Now, 
Let's listen again to Steve Krashen in the present. I have several goals I'd like to accomplish. The first is I want to save you some money. After that, we'll talk about language, about money. You may have noticed that books and journals these days about language acquisition have become very expensive. My colleague, Jeff McQuillan, describes them as insanely expensive, which I think is very accurate. Most people, including me, cannot afford to, describe, to subscribe rather to many journals or buy most professional books. So here's what I'm doing about it. I am no longer submitting articles to expensive journals, no longer writing books for publishers who charge high prices. My journal papers, oh, no, sorry, my journal papers are now submitted only to open access journals that do not charge writers or readers anything. Mine are available for free download. You can find them on my website, sdcrashen.com. D is my middle name, David, sdcrashen.com. I'm not the only one doing this. It's happening in other fields. And in our field, you can also find Jeff McQuillan's articles on the internet at backseatlinguist.com. Benico Mason's articles are at benicomason.net. And you can find lots of other excellent papers on an organization called ResearchGate, which takes pride in helping scholars share their research with other people. And now our progress. For those of you who want to see the details, it's available free of charge again at the websites I just mentioned. Studies over the years have shown that methods of language teaching that are consistent with what we call optimal input result in more language acquisition, and so far, promise to be more pleasant for students and teachers. So I'm going to talk about optimal input today. The optimal input hypothesis says we acquire language and develop literacy from input, from understanding what we hear and what we read, not from speaking and writing. Our ability to speak and write fluently and accurately is the result of acquiring language from input. The evidence for this briefly Studies showing the universality of a silent period, especially in informal language acquisition. Studies showing that if we increase output, we make students write more and speak more. It does not mean more language development. Also, the observation that language acquisition can occur without any output at all. And increasing input increases the quality of output. Finally, forcing output in language classes, making students talk before they're ready, is a cause of considerable anxiety. I first discussed optimal input years ago, and the concept has been deepened and improved by Benico Mason. We've concluded that optimal input has these four characteristics. Number one, of course, it's comprehensible. This doesn't mean every detail is comprehensible. Input can, be, input can be comprehensible, even if there's a little noise in the input, some incomprehensible pieces. This includes unknown vocabulary and grammar, rules that have not yet been acquired, but are not important for, for comprehension. In other words, language acquisition does not require that you understand every word and every part of every word. But of course, language acquirers should understand most of it. It's very, also, Number two, uh, optimal input is extremely interesting, very interesting. The word I like to use for this is compelling. Compelling input is so interesting, you temporarily forget that it's in another language. If input is comprehensible and compelling, you won't even notice the noise in the input, most likely. The next characteristic. Optimal input is rich. This is characteristic number three. It's rich in language that contributes to the message and the flow of the story or text. The language included in the input also gives the reader support in understanding and therefore acquiring new parts of language. Big point. It is not necessary to make sure that certain grammar and vocabulary is there in the input. Rich input automatically includes new, unacquired language that acquirers are ready for. We've called this I plus one. Number four, quantity. It takes a lot of comprehensible, compelling, rich input to make real progress. Optimal input is therefore, we use the word abundant, which provides more opportunities for the acquisition of language. The result of getting opt optimal input is subconscious language acquisition. 
language acquirers will be focused on the story, the message, and they will not always be aware that acquisition has happened. The knowledge will be represented subconsciously in their minds. We're currently examining these exciting hypotheses about optimal input. This is so interesting. I've been at this for a long time, and it seems to me that the research is getting more and more interesting. We're seeing more and more. Number one, here's what we found so far. The best forms of optimal input are, so far, number one, listening to stories. Stories that are made comprehensible in a variety of ways. For example, drawing pictures. The teacher draws a drawing while making, while, uh, when there's something difficult that's uh, coming in the story. Occasional translation. Explanations. This is called story listening, developed by Benico Mason. We think it's a very powerful way, a very pleasant way, to lead students to another form of optimal in input, the second form I'll discuss, and that is reading, which has been my obsession for several decades now. Professor Mason recommends providing large amounts of easy written input. In her English classes in Japan, she provides students with access to hundreds of books in easy English, sometimes called graded readers. These books give students the competence they need to read and understand authentic reading. And it's the job of the teacher to help students find easy books that are right for them. Uh, Benico Mason calls this stage guided self-selected reading, GSSR, and the idea is that GSSR will lead the students to eventually read authentic books. I think we have vastly ignored the importance of lots and lots of very easy reading. We've underestimated how much of it is necessary. We blame people for not acquiring their languages. We make no effort to make it possible or offering only the same ineffective and dull grammar classes. The languages I'm good at, I've had lots of easy reading. The languages I'm not good at, I haven't had lots of easy reading. It isn't available. Okay, second uh, hypothesis we're uh, looking at. Popular ways of acquiring second languages only work if they contain large amounts of optimal input. A good example, immersion, a very problematic term. This means, in general, living in the country where the language is spoken. Immersion may contain a great deal of optimal input. I've had this experience. Deep friendships with interesting people, interesting conversations, finding lots of good things to read. Or it may fail. It may contain a lot of non-optimal input. A uh, situation I'm in a lot where I have a working knowledge of the language, I have lots of superficial conversations with people, but not much real acquisition happens. Third idea we're pursuing, when hypothesis, when acquirers obtain optimal input, individual differences in rate of acquisition are diminished, may disappear. In other words, given the right conditions, optimal input, we are all gifted language acquirers. Nobody's any better than anyone else. I'm going to conclude all this with a case history consistent with the hypotheses I've presented to you. This came about when a new faculty member at my former university, USC, Southern California, contacted me. We had met before briefly at a conference. And of course, uh, we performed the usual required ritual of having coffee. Um, Professor Nushan Ashtari is from Iran. And in fact, her father uh, was born in Isfahan. Uh, interesting coincidence. When we finally met for coffee, what we did is what academics generally do. We told each other about what our current research was about. Now, normal people don't do this. Normal people talk about their families, and these days they talk about Donald Trump. But when it was my turn, I, I told she told me what she was working on, and I told her what I was doing. Basically, what I just told you. She immediately thought of the case of Mohammed Hisabi, a world-famous physicist from Iran, who passed away in 1992 at the age of 90. Professor Ashtari immediately saw the relevance of Professor Hasabi's experience to our work and found some original sources and translated them into English. Here's what we found out. Professor Hasabi was an accomplished polyglot, born in Iran, but lived in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, France, and the United States at various forms at various times in his life. These experiences, of course, contributed to his knowledge of Farsi, Arabic, English, and French. They were optimal input immersion situations. But he was also competent in German, and he had never had a German immersion experience. 
Here's what happened. On a trip to Germany, he wanted to speak to a store employee about an item in the store, but he couldn't. He decided right then to acquire German. He was 60 years old at the time. He made it a regular practice to, quote, study German for 30 minutes every evening for the next 30 years. For him, study included a great deal of reading. He began by reading what were called short and simple books used for teaching German to language learners. And after a few years, he was reading complex philosophical German books. He eventually wrote letters in German to a colleague who was a native speaker and who supplied him with books. She wrote to him and said, if someone didn't know you personally, they would think your mother tongue is German. Note that his approach to German is a version of guided self-selected reading developed by Benico Mason, which I just described. The short and simple books he read provided the competence that made reading authentic books possible. I have to point out, of course, that this report is not the only case history showing impressive progress in the second language through reading. What is clear is that the path from simple and short reading to authentic pleasure reading deserves a lot more attention in the language teaching profession. So now maybe you're asking, is this actually working? Are people actually learning from this kind of methodology? The answer is, let's listen to some comments from all over the world that we've received from students. Here's a guy from India. I love your method. You really helped me read the Hebrew language. Now I'm in the intermediate level of learning Hebrew, but you helped me build the foundation. We have John. I'm so excited about the Hebrew lessons you have on YouTube, but the Bible translation project folks I'm working with in Nigeria are even more excited than I am. In fact, I'm working with six translation consultants in training in southern Nigeria who will be studying Hebrew as part of their growth plans. A guy named Tobias writes, Your efforts are so valuable. Firstly, I'm finding the videos great to supplement my own Hebrew learning. However, I'm also about to start coordinating a Bible translation project starting with Genesis, and I'm seriously considering supplementing the training with your videos. They provide an opportunity for translators to learn some Hebrew that is otherwise next to impossible in my context. Keep up the great work. From Italy, your video lessons have been extremely useful for me. I was already studying biblical Hebrew as a self-taught. There's really everything I need to learn. Large, vocalized graphic characters, a clear pronunciation, clear images, but most of all, a magnificent teacher. We have people learning with their kids. Hannah writes, your humor has my kids cracking up. Quarantine plus Aleph with Beth equals six kids learning biblical Hebrew. Bob says, I've been following your lessons on YouTube for a bit now. It is by far the best language course I have ever seen, and I have seen a few. Anyway, I could go on, but you can go read these testimonials on our website, freehebrew.online. So freehebrew.online, help us share that website. And you can read more of our vision, our purpose about us, where we're coming from, and all of that there. So check it out. We have a page on how to use our videos and resources, and it's growing all the time and getting better. So check it out. Anyway, I'm excited about what God is doing in the world of biblical languages and Bible translation. And I hope you feel some of that excitement and can pray with me for this paradigm shift that God would awaken people to the value of this, and that we could serve the global church to the point that the next generation of Hebrew scholars surpasses us. They come blowing past us. That's what I want to see. So thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, review it, share it. You've been listening to Working for the Word, where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.